Well, welcome uh, everybody to the uh, our ongoing in conversation series, which uh, started off live uh, in person at the Royal Society of Medicine, Number One Wimpole Street, and indeed uh, our special guest this evening, uh, Sir Michael Palin, was due to come and talk at the RSM on Monday evening, the first uh, of June, but uh, this little virus cropped up, and so. He kindly agreed to do this uh, as a webinar, and that's uh, uh, why we're here. Uh, we have over 2,000 registrants, very proud of that, and some fantastic uh, donations to our ongoing education program. So uh, let's start off with uh, me asking Michael uh, a question. So uh, Michael, uh, can you tell us uh, what it's like to be described as the nicest man in England? Oh, it's terrible affliction. It really is. If I could take a pill to make that go away, um, I'd be very, very happy. It's just it's not something I thought of. Someone else thought of it for me, and it became a sort of journalistic cliche. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was either me or Gary Lineker, and then Gary Lineker did something rather naughty, and I was just left alone, adrift, as the nicest man in England. But I'm not really at all. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a bit of a burden to carry around. Yeah, I can imagine that, yes, uh, uh, around your neck. But you're also described as the most famous Yorkshireman, and uh, you, you come originally from Sheffield. Uh, yeah. uh, Ranmore uh, is the district, I think, in yeah. Sheffield, you come, which is the posh part of Sheffield. I'm, uh, I'm informed. So, just tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Sheffield in the fifties and uh, late. Well, I mean, uh, we did grow up in the West Side, which is where most of the money is and the big houses. My parents had very little money, so I was aware quite early on what it was like to um, not have um, a big car or a big house. We had a fairly big house, but it was always it was rented and all that. Um, Sheffield was a, a curious mixture. It was a very beautiful um, West Side of the city. It had access to the Peak District, so the uh, reservoirs there. Um, it, it was very beautiful country. Uh, on the east side was just heavy duty steelworks. And one of the steelworks my father worked at. Um, and they were extraordinary. I mean, it was, there was a dark cloud most of the time over the, over the eastern side of the city. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, we were kind of proud of it because it was producing all the iron and steel for, um, for Britain, especially during the war. And this, of course, gradually fell away and ended up in the sort of the, the film of Full, Full Monty was all shot and, and written about Sheffield, which is when the iron and steel business just collapsed virtually overnight. So it was always on the edge of being a big industrial city. And then you got sent away to school, as to boarding school, to Shrewsbury? Yes, yes. My father was at Shrewsbury School and he was determined that he should send me to Shrewsbury School. So I think he sold most of my mother's... Um, <laughs> valuable possessions that had been handed down to her. And I, I did go to, I got into Shrewsbury School. He was very, very pleased about that. And did, you, did you enjoy your schooling days or they, they were quite yes. arduous, I think? I, I mean, I wish I could say, no, I was thrashed within an inch of my life and uh, was utterly miserable. And, and you know, I, I wasn't actually, because generally I'm fairly optimistic and there were some pretty awful people there but there would be in any institution and you just make sure that you um, find your way of negotiating your way through it and because I was on my own if, if you like without my parents to go back to every evening I worked out a way of, of living with um, a number of people I didn't particularly like and values I didn't particularly like but enjoying a lot of other things such as great sports activities wonderful um, uh, you know, the, the location there by the river was wonderful and a few teachers who were invaluable. And I, I think Charles Darwin was an alumnus of that school I read uh, somewhere, is that right? Yes, yeah. he, he was indeed. And yeah. um, uh, He sort of followed me through my life and uh, recently I became a member of the Athenaeum Club in London um, and um, if you go in there, Charles Darwin is behind the bar. 
I mean, not serving, but there's a huge portrait of it hanging behind the bar. It must have cheered a lot of people up over the years. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, he, maybe he was the inspiration for all your traveling that we'll um, come to, on to and oh, talk about uh, no. later. So from Shrewsbury down to Oxford, uh, Brasenose College, and there you met Terry Jones, right? Yes, uh, I actually met a man called Robert Hewison, who was uh, from London and was rather smart and uh, had the sort of metropolitan confidence that I lacked coming from Sheffield. We both loved the goon shows. We loved, uh, Spike, uh, we loved Spike's work, Peter Sellers' work also, um, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. And we just joked together a lot until Robert suddenly said, well, we can make some money out of joking, you know, you can put a cabaret together for 30 minutes and, and earn some money. And I mean, I didn't know what a cabaret was. I thought it was something rather naughty and Parisian. Um, but I came from Sheffield. I didn't know what, what pizza was. Um, uh, but he, made, he got me together and we did our very first uh, comedy gig if you like, uh, on the stage at the Oxford University Psychological Society Christmas party. <laughs> and we were listened to in total silence for 30 minutes. <laughs> but uh, they loved it. <laughs> and, and you read art, uh, modern history there, right? Did yes. You, did yeah. you enjoy the academic side of it or were we so too busy doing cabarets? I was very busy doing, doing cabaret, acting, writing, making friends, you know, I could make friends at Oxford who in a different way from school. School, it was all our regimented. You made friends in your class or your, your particular sporting set or whatever. At Oxford, you could choose from a very wide range of people. And that's where I got to know Terry Jones, who was actually at uh, St. Edmund Hall at the time through acting. And we just spent most of our time trying to either write, devise or perform uh, comedy and sketches and in the evening we, we try and do our history essay and we had a very a lovely indulgent uh, tutor Mr. Collew Eric who um, said look you, 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 you should keep on with your acting I think he meant because you're rather better at it than you are at history but uh, you know it's come back to haunt me in a way and I, the book I've just written about HMS Erebus in 1839 it's a bit of history, and I never ever thought that in the end I'd be writing history books. Fantastic book! I've just uh, just been reading it. But yeah. wh where does the sort of craziness, the sort of surrealist uh, element to your humour come from? Does it does it come from Oxford, or did it develop when you got to London and the kind of London scene in the in the early sixties? Well, I I mean I think it was there all the time. Uh, at school, you know fairly quickly what your kind of role is. And I was able to make people laugh, um, not necessarily by telling jokes, but by, you know, the old thing of imitating the masters, doing their voices, doing their gestures, observing how they were. And people thought this was amazing. Um, and uh, I used to do a certain amount of that at, at school. So I knew I could make people laugh. And my, my, view of life was always um, tainted or conditioned or, or indeed enhanced by, by humour. I did tend to see the absurd side in, in everything that was going on, whereas other people were taking life absolutely seriously. And I think probably that's what helped. And you and Terry Jones working together, I mean, was, were you sparking off each other in terms of script writing and jokes and, and lines? I guess you were. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, you find somebody who you can work with and it, it's very rare. It doesn't, it's a difficult thing to get right. It's not just they make you laugh, you make them laugh. There's got to be something which you've got to complement each other. Someone's got to provide something which the other person doesn't, but it comes together to create something you both feel proud of. And, and Terry was um, when we were writing together, Terry was extremely good at story, plot, narrative, and I was probably, my strength was in creating comic characters, um, which we would then, Terry would bind them together in a sketch or a film or whatever we were doing. So that was our, that was our sort of dynamic. I was going to ask you about John Cleese and Graham Chapman. Graham being a, a doctor qualified from Bart, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, but, but they were a sort of complementary writing. He did, but tell us how, how 
I, you know, through the Frost program writing for that, how the sort of Python um, concept developed? Was it, was it a sudden revelation or? Well, no, it was the Frost report. Uh, which was first broadcast in 1966, I think, or, or late 65, was a bit like a sort of writer's waiting room. David Frost had gathered together all sorts of writers from all sorts of backgrounds. There were, there were sort of 50 or 60 of us writers there he could, he could sort of call on, and everyone was competing to be in the show. Um, and a number of us were from varsity backgrounds, John and Graham and Eric Idle from uh, Cambridge and myself and, and, uh, and Terry from Oxford. And I think because we, there was a kind of university tradition of doing comedy sketches culminating in the Edinburgh Festival, the Footlights uh, was the Cambridge group and we would call ourselves the Etcetras. We, we had a similar way of channeling the comedy and so we looked at each other and what they were doing, what we were each doing. And John and Graham were just writing the most marvelous sketches, um, really some of, some of the absolute best. And of course, when Python got going, they wrote Cheese Shop and um, The Dead Parrot and all of the argument sketch. Um, whereas Terry and I were writing little, little bits and here and there, bits of film. And we kind of looked at each other over the years and said, we like what you, what you do. And they said, actually, we rather like what you do. We felt, well, we can't do what you do. And they said, well, we can't do what you do. How about getting together? So in 69, three years after the Frost Report had trained us all up, we, um, we, we decided to make a bid for freedom and uh, write our own stuff. So we were, talking about, we were talking about the famous Python team. And I was going to, to say that... Uh, when I was at Cambridge in 69 to 72, we used to crowd into the junior common room and, uh, and watch those amazing shows. The, the, uh, of all those Python shows, do you have any favorites or any particular ones? The, I was watching the fish slapping episode on the, where you get plunged in the end into, the, into a river. <laughs> yeah, but into, a into the canal at Teddington. Yes, the fish slapping was, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I defy anyone to not find that vaguely funny. And when we recently, I was in North Korea, and actually uh, the director had brought along the clip of Fish Lapping Dance, and I showed it to my guide, a you know, young 28-year-old Korean lady who didn't know anything about what I did back home. And she watched the Fish Lapping Dance and, and really cracked up. And she said, <laughs> this, is, this is what you do? And I said, well, I mean, I did a long time ago. I thought, this is so odd, you know, she's just coming, oh, he's, he's a fish slapper. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> and what about the, the, the Norwegian blue parrot sketch? That's another uh, old favourite uh, that comes out. Yes, I mean, that, that's, that's become so well known now that John and I, well, I mean, I wouldn't say we're bored doing it, but it's kind of, it's very predictable. So we have to try and make each other laugh throughout it. But I, I remember very fondly one which I don't know whether it even went out it was very early on and it was John and myself dressed as Frenchmen in long coats and uh, striped um, t-shirts talking about the the Anglo-French sheep this was a time of Concord you know le mouton le mouton anglo-français it is and we would do a little bit of French and we had one moustache between us and the one who was speaking wore the moustache when they <laughs> finished doing their bit they'd take the moustache off and stick it on the other person and after a bit the starch came rather sort of dry and sort of hung down and then fell off and it was just I thought this is a shambles no one's going to watch this but <laughs> it remains one of my favorite sketches. <laughs> it was the sort of shambolic nature of it all that that made it so interesting and that, yeah what are the what are the differences from the comedy before was there was no sort of punch line and the often your sketches yeah. ended in the middle of uh, of the actual sketch with yeah. Graham That's Chapman used to come in and say, stop this where it's all yes. too silly. Yeah. Yeah. That was, did you feel then that it was, uh, you know, innovative, that it would be, that it was something that was going to last now 40 years plus? Not at all. I honestly say that. And I think we'd all agree. We, um, we enjoyed doing it. We knew it was a bit mischievous and different. And the BBC were, bit, were quite confused by it. 
and decided to do it, good for them, but they put it out very, very late at night. Um, on Saturday, I think it was, on BBC Two in what was then known as the graveyard slot, where they put, uh, satire had once flourished and it died and dried up. And so no, no programs were doing terribly well in that slot. And they said, we'll put Python there, but at least they let us get on with it. Um, for us, we were, I mean, we, we did think that we were doing something um, different, especially with the animation, Terry Gilliam's wonderful animation. And as you say, the different format, things uh, stopping in the middle, beginning and end, the Spanish Inquisition of somebody coming on and then rushing off again because couldn't remember the lines. Um, but we felt at the same time, is this just us? This, is this just very in? Um, and it was a great surprise uh, to see, and has been over the years, to see how Python has become cherished by a certain number of people and seen as something frightfully important. We didn't feel at the time it was a way of making a living. Yeah, it was our first thing in, almost our first thing in television. And then it was popular in America, um, perhaps surprisingly, really, yes. because it's so English. Yeah. Well, yeah. what's the expert? The Americans, uh, they, they sort of reveled in it now, and they still do, I think. They watch it now. Yeah, it's a most interesting um, uh, sort of story, how it broke in America, because it, it, it got quite a sort of cult audience in England by 1970-71, and there were Americans including a journalist called Fred Friendly, who wrote for the Washington Post, who came over and said, this is just great, you know, and kept uh, name checking us in his uh, reports. Uh, and yet, uh, we did a film called Now for Something Completely Different, which was financed by the man who ran Playboy at that time, Victor Lowndes. And this was to break us in America. And it just didn't. People just didn't understand it. And the people who were trying to publicize it didn't understand it. That was an important thing. So we'd sort of given up um, any hope of it being in America on, on a grand scale. And it was in 1973, I think, quite a long time later, that the man who ran the public broadcasting station in Dallas, Texas, um, happened to see Python while he was checking out BBC product in New York and said, um, oh, this is quite funny. This is kind of odd. Can I, have, uh, can I take these shows back for the weekend, show them to my guys out there? They all loved them and they played all 45 shows over the entire weekend. So we broke in Dallas and then on the, uh, mainly on this sort of the schools uh, and, and university circuit around America, it became incredibly popular and became a cult show. But I think that was because it was on public broadcasting in America. There were no ads in the middle. And I mean, no, no channel with adverts would have uh, wanted Monty Python anyway, because it, you know, it just made made everything sound so absurd and so silly and it was considered rather rude but it was just what the um the students wanted and they they really took us to their their hearts and what about the films the you know, the first one you, you've already mentioned now for something completely yeah. different uh, and then uh the uh, the arthurian legends uh, uh yeah. monty python and the holy grail yeah. any any Insights about those. I, I just love some of the, the, the sketches from both of those shows. Well, yeah, I mean, we were, I, it's just very interesting that my favorite subjects when I was at school were history and geography. And generally you feel, well, school is school, and you put that behind you and off you go. And that's what I thought. I'm going to, I've gone into the world of television and all that. I won't need to know all the dates and the kings and the, and the history of this and when mercy was founded and all that sort of stuff. And then suddenly we end up realizing that we know an awful lot about this sort of stuff, and yet we can't make great sense of it. So let's make it the basis of, of something comic. And the, the idea of, of choosing the search for the Holy Grail was that we could all play individual knights. Um, and then we could create lots of other characters because the whole legend of King Arthur had been written so often that nobody really knew what the truth was, if indeed there was any truth there anyway. So you could kind of create any characters. And so you could have, you know, Tim the Enchanter and the Lord of Swamp Castle and all these people, and yet still carry through the story of the search for the Grail. So like all the, the I think the best material we did, there was a certain seriousness and this was personified by Graham Chapman, 
uh, <laughs> wonderful and uh, lost to medicine, but a wonderful gain to the to the acting uh, uh, fraternity because Graham had this ability to play very convincingly someone who was utterly confused about what was going on around him. As King Arthur, you've just you know, you know people say, what, what are you doing here? But, uh, you know, I'm your king. We don't have kings here. We're all democratic. And, and he would have to deal with all these stroppy peasants and difficult people and all that. And in Life of Brian, he was a, you know, a man who was a victim of, of um, you know, false identification. He wasn't, he wasn't the Messiah. He didn't know anything about that. And people kept saying, you know, you, you, you're, you're the Messiah. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Um, uh, I know he's the Messiah. I've followed a few and all these, just, and just Graham was absolutely brilliant at playing the central, serious, central character seriously. And that was so, that was so, so important. I never thought that seriousness of, of you know, the material and the history behind it and the performance would be the basis of something that could be very funny. And you must have got a bit of flack for the uh, sort of irreligious, uh, sacrilegious, uh, some people might say, uh, scenes from the life of Brian. Did you, did you pick up any flack from the religious uh, side of life on that? Oh, yeah. Well, of course we did. There were, there were no sort of severe injuries, but uh, a bit of flack was flying. And um, yeah. I think a classic, a classic evening was when John Cleese and myself went on to a film to a, sorry, a chat show called Friday Night, Saturday Morning, hosted by Tim Rice, where they had the Bishop of, um, of Southwark and uh, Malcolm Muggeridge, and we were going to debate the film. And, and I think that we sort of prepared for it, because we know this we were going to be given a bit of a grilling by people who knew about religion and all that. And all they did was just try and mock it and be funny and talk about, well, I hope they get their 30 pieces of silver and that. And it was a very, to me, a very shocking kind of interview because I thought, all right, we've, we've, we've got a film which we can defend. You know, Jesus is not Brian. That's clearly shown because you see Jesus elsewhere preaching at the Sermon on the Mount and all that sort of thing. So you know that's not true. And the, and the film, if it's about anything, it's about religious authoritarianism and dogmatism and, and people who aren't Jesus telling you what to believe. Um, and they, they just mocked it. And it was, it was embarrassing because they, they, they thought they could win the audience. And in the end, they just sort of, it seemed very, very sort of coarse what they were doing. And Malcolm Muggeridge called it his cheap 10th rate film, you know. It wasn't <laughs> cheap and it wasn't 10th rate, it would be 8th rate possibly. <laughs> so that was a very, that was some, in a sense, that was the flat, um, you, you know, point blank uh, fired at John and myself. It was funded by George Harrison, one of the films. Was, yes, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. Good old George. Uh, well, good for George. I mean, yeah. the thing is that EMI were going to um, finance the life of Brian. And it was two people lower in the ranks of EMI. And they gave us some seed money to go and build sets in Tunisia. And um, suddenly the head of EMI, my uncle Michael Carreras, actually read the script. And he said, we're doing this? You must be joking. This is shocking, disgusting, horrible stuff. I'm mean, not, you know, we, we're not putting our name to this. And call, they, they called off the, um, the financing. They paid us a little bit back, but that was it. We had, um, a, you know, half built um, synagogues and things in, in, um, in Tunisia and um, nothing to do in them. And uh, Eric Idle knew George Harrison. George turned out to be an enormous Python fan. And he said, you know, he'd lend us five million dollars or five, give us five million dollars. And people said later, you know, George, this is just crazy. Five million dollars for a film? I mean, why do you do that? I said, well, you know, I just wanted to see it. And that was <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful way. Uh, a very expensive yeah, cinema it. ticket, somebody, uh, somebody joked. Very expensive uh, cinema that. ticket in history, but I, <laughs> Thank you, George. I mean, that was just the greatest thing. And isn't there a line at the end of the, the song that um, Eric Idle wrote at the end, um, always look on the bright side of life. There's a reference to, you won't get your money back on this one, uh, I think. Uh, yes, yes, right. If you yeah. stay long enough in the cinema, it goes on and on that song. Yeah. And there's some real gems in there, yeah. <laughs>
Fantastic. Well, we've got a, a, a question from Gillian Lang, who was one of our ex-trustees. Professor yeah. Lang is now uh, uh, in charge of NICE, the uh, organization that controls drug uh, yes. uh, and so on in the UK. So Gillian says, where did the name Monty Python come from? <laughs> where did the name Monty Python came, uh, came from? It, it, uh, it, it originated really because the, the BBC wanted us to call it something sensible and we wanted to call it something completely um, um, ridiculous. Uh, that, that was just because, you know, we didn't want it to be called um, the John Cleese show or six guys and a gal or any of these things like that. We said it's just going to be a very off the wall show. and We'd like to call it something like um, It's or um, Owl Stretching Time or the Algae Banging Moment. I mean, we had these ridiculous <laughs> titles that were around and the BBC got rather cross and said, look, you know, we've got costumes ready now. They've got to be labeled and they've got to know the name of the show. Um, and he said, well, we keep thinking of it. But it wasn't until they said, well, you know, we can't, we can't issue any contracts to pay you unless you come up with a title. So we worked instantly um, on the title. But we said we want it to be, they said, they came up actually with the idea of flying circus. That would be a rather interesting thing. They said, couldn't quite understand why. They said, John Cleese's flying circus. Well, John didn't want to be that. He didn't want to be lumbered with a show that might be a total disaster. So we said, can we make up our own name? And we, we went to them and said, we've, we've got a name, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Um, and um, they, you know, looked predictably stunned, <laughs> like the dead parrot. We said, what? Why? And we said, well, it's just, you know, that's our name. And they said, all right, but everyone will know it as Flying Circus in the future. So there it was. <laughs> well, uh, uh, let, let's go on to talk about uh, a film beyond Python. Oh, now, before we do that, maybe we should talk a little bit about why it came to an end. Um, I mean, obviously, sadly, Graham Chapman died in 89, I think. Yeah. Uh, ton tonsillar cancer, uh, I think, uh, took mm. him away in the end. And, and uh, uh, of course, the Python brand still goes on. You still work together. But... Did, did things change after that as you was that a crucial factor the loss of Graham well I think that really we had we had written ourselves out of all television material by about 1973 I think or 72 um, unusually because this doesn't happen very often we were a comedy group that could transfer to film and were able to make films that did equally well um, but they were they all each film had to have a a very distinctive feeling to it um and the meaning of life which is 1982 was the most difficult of all the films to come up with fresh new material well there was, there was some wonderful stuff in it like the liver donor who's <laughs> confronted in his house by these two um surgeons <laughs> in white coats who said we've come for your liver <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Well, yeah, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dead yet." No, it says here you've got to give us your liver. Uh, yeah, but when I die, no, it doesn't say anything about dying. Come on, lie down here. And they, get his, they take his liver out with him protesting quite strongly at the time. Anyway, there was some great stuff in Meaning of Life, but it was it was it was essentially a mess compared to um, the Holy Grail, which had the story of the search for the grail and life of Brian had the Bible story. And I think we felt after that we'd written ourselves out of films as well. So that was 1982. We all went off to make various different films ourselves. I worked with Terry Gilliam on Brazil and then John Cleese um, on A Fish Called Wanda. But when Graham died, I felt very strongly that any move for a Python reunion wouldn't really work because the essential thing about Python was that it was written and performed by six uh, people and everybody contributed in different ways, different kinds of writing, different standards of writing, but everybody was indispensable. And once Graham had died, sadly, it was like a sort of six legged table and the legs dropped off and it's, it's unsteady. So um, I, I felt after that, personally, I, I think others did as well, that we couldn't really 
reunite as Python. Um, and, and then we, of course, it, in the end we did, we had this big um, show in 2014, um, um, you know, one down, five to go at uh, the O2 Arena. And the reason I think we all agreed to that was because they had, the technology was so good that they could show Graham, they could integrate Graham's material into the show. And they did so brilliantly. And we would all come on at the beginning and then they'd show Graham on the screen above. And the audience went wild, you know, it was lovely. But, um, then, then it was- Amazing wonderful. auditorium. There's a question from David Edwards here. Uh, what was it, how much fun was it to work with the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band? I mean, that's another amazing name, isn't it? Yeah, so. yes, yeah. very, very good. Well, we found a, a group that were, were sort of had the similar sort of humor to ourselves. This was in Do Not Just Your Set which was pre-Python. But the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band were all out of art school and playing strange instruments and singing very strange songs, most of which were drug related. And yet this was on a children's show that went out at about 5.15. But they all, oh, hello, yellow tree and pink sky. And the people at Reedy Fusion who put it on thought, this was wonderful. Well, children will love this sort of thing. Where it was really all about sort of it going out of his mind. Um, lovely Neil Innes, that's where we met Neil Innes who sang such wonderful songs like How Sweet to Be an Idiot and all that. Um, and they were, they were a really wacky group to work with. Um, and Viv Stanchel was, was, was truly kind of a, a comedy anarchist. I mean, he was a very, very bizarre man. He would ring you up sometimes and he liked practical jokes. And he rang up home once, talked to my wife and said, uh, I'm coming back from Cornwall, um, I'm a fan and I've got some fish to bring for Mr. Palin. Uh, will he be in? <laughs> and she kept saying, what? And he said, I've got, uh, uh, it's actually about, oh, it's about 300 weight of Scottish, of, of, of Cornish mackerel. And anyway, it turned out in the end to be substantial. But there's a long, elaborate sort of playing around with life that he enjoyed so much. <laughs> Had he no longer with us, nor is Neil, yeah. which is a great pity. Sad, that was not, not long ago. So let's, we better move on to travel, but before I do that, A Fish Called Wanda, there's a, a memorable uh, character there, Ken, uh, with his stammer. Um, just tell us a little bit about, about why uh, that character came up. Yeah, that was your invention, you certainly played it. Did uh, Ken the stammerer? Uh, yes, I mean, it was in the 19, um, uh, mid-80s. John Cleese came to me and said, I've written this film and I'd like, some, I'd like you to help because one of the characters in this heist, one of the gangsters has a stammer and he knew, John knew that my father had a stammer and John wanted to know how a stammer worked. He wanted to make sure that it was kind of a, you know, authentic and not just someone saying blah, 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 da, 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 da. So we sort of worked together on various aspects of it, the psychological, you know, the pressure on the speaker makes it worse. People can sing perfectly well. Um, stammerers can sing perfectly well. Um, whereas they can't speak without um, without a uh, problem. So John was very interested in all this and said, well, yeah, will you play this character called Ken? And um, of such a funny film, I thought, well, I, I'll have a go and I'll try and make the character someone who's sympathetic, despite the fact he's an awful crook. I'll try and give him something so it doesn't just seem like a a joke against stammerers. Um, and for some people it worked, some people it didn't work. For some people who stammered were offended by it and, and I can sort of understand that. But others said, well, it's great that, you know, stammering is, it's, it's around, we all, we know so many people who stammer and here is a stammerer being a character in a film. And it, it led me in the end to uh, be asked to give my name to a center for stammering in children and um, it's called the Michael Palin Centre, the only time I've ever given my name to anything like that. And it's really been one of the things I'm most proud of in my life. And I feel, well, there we are, it's gone round full circle. If my, if my dear dad had been able to attend the, something like the Michael Palin Centre, and if it was something like that had been around when he was a kid, um, life might have been utterly and completely different for him because it was a it was an awful thing to be stuck with this. With they, they must be having difficulties with COVID crisis in the same way that the RSM is, uh, being everybody being out of the building, yeah? Yes, they, they are. They're doing a lot of like this, a sort of, um, a lot of Zoom, a lot of digital um, 
therapy. Uh, we're going on trying to do the very best we can. Like you, there's a problem of funding and all that, trying to keep it going. But it is, it's a charity I feel personally so, um, uh, is, is, is so important because it's not, very often stammering is not a popular cause. I mean, cancer quite rightly, um, heart problems and all that uh, tend to get more money. Uh, but um, stammering does, I know personally how it affects people and the you know the awful difference it can make to a life and the difference it can make to change your life if you if you can manage it so i think it is so important and i just hope i know they'll keep going because they're terrific therapists doing great work that's so, the michael palin center for stammering children is that right uh, that's yes right? i think it, that, that's what it's called yes and there's the arsc which is the um association for research into stammering children we, you can check we can check that out on, yes on that's very nice so let's, let's move on to the traveling, Michael, and just tell us how, I think it started with Around the World in 80 Days, uh, the Jules Verne book. What gave you the idea, or did, did the BBC come up and say, would you, would you do it for us? Uh, the BBC came up and asked, would you do it for us? Um, they said, we've got this idea. In fact, the man at the BBC, a man called Will Wyatt, who was, I think, head of a documentaries or whatever but said it's such a um it, it's such a major project and such a confidential project that i can't talk to you over the phone i'll have to come to your house so he came around to my house and talked for a while and said we, we have chosen you for all your various qualities of sort of adventurousness um you know, human connection fun humor laughter um, and um, geographical sort of interest to become the man who will go around the world in 80 days in 1988 to see if they can still do it um, as they did in 1888 or whenever it was um, when it was first written without taking any aircraft and just the idea of going around the world immediately uh, grabbed my attention because I've always loved I'd love foreign travel and not done much of it, but I'd, you know, I love atlases, globes, maps, stories of adventure and all that. So I said, yes. It was only when I got uh, to, I think we were in Madras and there was some problem with a ship that had been um, burned out and we were waiting for our own ship two days later that the director admitted that um, I was the fifth person they'd asked to do it. <laughs> so, you know, they'd be very nice to me as they'd been very nice to others, including Noel Edmonds and Miles Kington and uh, Alan Wicker, of course, was first on the list. <laughs> and uh, Omar Ahmed saying on that trip of all the places that you traveled to, uh, which was your favorite uh, and why? Uh, there must've been some adventures because that's one of your seven major travels, wasn't it? It was the first. But it, was the fir it was the first one, and it was a, it was a little. I was a little unsure how to how to do it. To be honest, I mean, very plainly, had I been chosen because I was an actor, um, and therefore did they want me to be a sort of joke Phileas Fogg character, like in the in the films and the Mike Todd film and all that. Mm -hmm. um, or was I being chosen as a serious reporter, which of course I was not. I wasn't a very good, very good at doing interviews and all that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, quite what, how was I supposed to play it? No one seemed to quite know. So I was just there and busking my way through Europe, doing a bit of chat here and there um, and sort of feeling that, well, I've got to, I've got to, create the story so I've got to be I've got to be a bit Phileas Foggish and then when we everything went wrong in Saudi Arabia and the ships didn't turn up and we had to get a dial that hadn't been sort of checked out or anything like that we took it from Dubai where we were not supposed to go we we're supposed to go from Amman and we were going to spend um, seven days on this dhow with a crew of 18 Gujarati fishermen, only one of whom, the captain, spoke a little bit of English. Um, there was nowhere to sleep except on the deck. Um, the, um, the lavatory was a barrel hanging over the back of the ship. You had to literally climb out of the ship and into the barrel to sit and 
do what you had to do. <laughs> it was kind of quite tricky. <laughs> Doctors will appreciate this because you always have to be, put, know where to put the tube in the right place. Well, the first time I sat there, I, I sat in this barrel and faced the ship, which of course is stupidly wrong because my you know, lower area was not aligned with the <laughs> sort of, sort of <laughs> aperture. <laughs> so I had to turn around, uh, very embarrassed. Uh, but there we were. So, so for seven days, we were with these fishermen and we just really learnt to get on. Just to move. We, we struggled with the language. I learned a bit of what they, their language. They learned a bit of mine. I blew up the globe I'd taken with them and showed them where we were going. And in turn, they made us food. We brought food from Sainsbury's, which we're going to eat around the world. And um, they said, we'll make you curries. And they shared the curries they made, which were delicious, on board the ship with us. And at the end of seven days, a total bond had been created between, you know, reasonably well-paid um, professional BBC crew from England and um, hugely underpaid uh, sailors from, from Gujarat in a very slow uh, sailing boat. But we, we needed them more than, far more than they needed us. And they were so good. And at the end, I remember hugging some of them and saying, wow, you know, I really miss you guys. And that changed my whole attitude to traveling. And I realized that I hadn't once thought, how am I going to play this? Um, you know, what am I, how am I going to report on this? Or how am I going to make light of this and be, be sort of, uh, David Niven um, on the Indian Ocean and I'd just been myself and from then on I realized that was the best I could do just to be myself and hope people appreciated that. I think you've sort of created a, a special type of tourism that does relate more to the local people that rather than the sort of five-star hotel business class flights uh, which many of my yeah. tend to but what, what about some scrapes, Michael? You, you were mentioning uh, a food issue in, on the Sahara yeah. trip. Yes, um, we were in a refugee camp in um, Algeria. And uh, they were, again, people with the least give you the most. It's so wonderful. And anyway, they, they'd actually bought a camel, bit of camel um, for us. And we were there for about a week. And the camel was pretty good by, on Monday. But by Friday... It was a little bit high. Friday, I'm given a bit of camel liver. It doesn't taste very good, but you can't be rude. And the lady who made it presented it to me with such love and affection and uh, so great sadness to see us go on our way. So I took it. And for the rest of that day, I was incredibly ill. I had to stop an entire convoy of vehicles through the desert and throw up with everyone sort of turning away and saying, oh my God, Palin. But it was a real, what Barry Humphreys used to write, the sort of technicolor yawn, wonderful sort of multicolored vomit <laughs> in the desert. And um, all my, all the crew were very embarrassed. And it was one of our, our sort of um, uh, Arab uh, security people, or just, it wasn't, he was just some, one of the drivers actually came along, um, an older man, and, and just gave me some water and put his hand on my, Brown, but I was very touched that he'd actually come to sort of bother. So this went on. I had to go and interview the head of a guerrilla army out in the desert. And so I would just go in and I, I would be able to control myself just long enough to ask him a few questions about his plans to take over that part of Africa. Then I'd have to say, sorry, I've got to go out. I just check the script and I would go out and have a quick vomit and then come back and carry on. It was a most, most bizarre day. Um, and it got worse, I won't tell you. The toilet facilities in some of those places in West Africa were not. Oh my God. And, and I think, didn't you run into problems with gorillas in uh, Nepal when you were doing your Himalaya? Yeah. Yes, we were, um, we were with the, 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 the certain parts of the world um, have problems at different times. I mean, now where we were in, in Central Africa and Niger and places like that, we wouldn't be able to go there now because there's so much um, terrorist activity there um, and jihadists are sort of roaming through the desert. Um, and Nepal, you can now go to, it's fine. But when we were there, it was quite tricky and there was the, the Maoist um, opposition were very strong there. 
and they wanted to get rid of the government. We were in this small village with our Gurkha officer who was showing us around. <clears throat> and <clears throat> and um, uh, suddenly they appear in the, in, in the evening before we were going to film the next morning. <clears throat> and all the local people sort of shied away. And these guys came and said, um, we just would like to talk to your director and um, your um, officer, please. And they took them off and went to talk to them in somewhere in the in the forest nearby and none, neither of them came back for a while the director came back much later and said they're, they're actually going to keep the officer under arrest and they did and he it was the first time that the maoists had actually kidnapped and arrested um a british officer and there was great furore about it um but it was quite it was quite hairy then because the whole all the villagers thought we were trouble and they couldn't wait to get us out and sort of shouted at us as we left, which was not the way they were when, when we arrived. They were rather pleasant. Mm, scary. So yeah. you, there's a question about what you, what your favourite place in the world. Uh, would it be somewhere in uh, Himalaya or the Himalayas, as some people pronounce it? Or you, uh, somewhere near Machu Picchu is mentioned? Yes, there's a, there's, there is a place called, um, uh, which is quite extraordinary. It's on the river Urabamba, which is... Uh, tributary of the Amazon and it tumbles through the Andes um, and then into the Amazon and it was our way out of Peru when we were doing full circle so we'd gone to Cusco and we'd gone to Machu Picchu then instead of going back to Cusco as most people do we went on up the Urubamba and came to this extraordinary rapids um, which led into an area called the Pongo de Manaik and it was, a, it was a, a violent white water um, flow. There were rock, jagged rocks coming out. We were, we were in sort of, sort of like, like long open um, canoes, really, being driven incredibly deftly by the local people in and out of the rocks. But there were so many times I thought, this is it, we've had it. You know, sheer basalt walls coming up. We veer straight up and then, uh, then turning off just before we came to the wall. And we ended up suddenly in a paradise of clear, calm water. This is called the, uh, I think it's called the Pongo de Manaik. And it's um, on the borders of, um, of Peru and, and well, not, you know, it's on the borders of the Urubamba and the Amazon River. And it was just sheer uh, black basalt walls with water running down, great big sort of black butterflies, um, the size of your hand flying around, and utter silence and peace after the ordeal of the rapids. And I remember thinking, wow, this, this is heaven. You've had a medical crisis not long ago, Michael, and I think, uh, you yeah. know, might be talking since our audience are, are mainly medics, um, yeah. you, you ended up in, in hospital talk us through that experience well um about uh, five years ago i was um diagnosed with a um a loose mitral valve and my cardiologist uh, malcolm walker said well maybe you you just carry on at the moment and it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be any problem any curtailment of your activities you're a fit man you'll know when something's going wrong and for five years it was fine and I suddenly found at the, um, the, the end of last, uh, sorry, beginning of last year that I was, my, I was running on the heath, I have to heath and, and, and it was all getting a bit more difficult and I was getting rather breathless. So I went to, um, to see him and he said, yes, it's, um, we'll keep an eye on this because it, it may be getting worse. I was doing some filming, I was playing a character called The Green Man in a BBC series called Wurzel Gummidge, you know, starring Mackenzie Crook. And I was, it was a very heavy weight I had to carry around. I had a huge pack, an enormous coat embroidered with all sort of, you know, the, the leaves and the trees and the flowers of the field. So I was like a walking tree. And at the very end of the shoot, this was in July, I had to walk up <coughs> a fairly steep slope and I just, my heart suddenly virtually stopped. I realised I couldn't go on. I'd never experienced anything quite like that. So I stopped and they said, and it, I relaxed and then I went to see my cardiologist and um, he said, yes, I'll, I'll put you in touch with someone called David Lawrence who will go and tidy up 
inside your heart. And in September um, of last year, I went into Barts and, um, and, and had a wonderful experience in the sense that it was all done amazingly efficiently. There were wonderfully friendly people there. Um, and, uh, and it was a great hospital to be in, actually. I loved it because a bit of history there as well. Um, so, yes, it's now, it's now, I'm now recovered, I suppose. And, and there's a link there because your son, Will, who uh, yes. I know, a lovely man, like, just like you, a nice man. And, he, and he's working with Marcus Setchell, one of my buddies, to, yes. uh, to, to, for the celebration of the 900th anniversary of that hospital, founded in 12, uh, 1123. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're raising money for to the restoration of the Great Hall, aren't they? Yes. Uh, Yes, that's right. It was quite quite a coincidence. Will had been working at the um, uh, the Royal Naval College in Greenwich and doing the he'd been responsible for the restoration of the painted hall there. And this was seen and, and uh, obviously approved of by the Bart's heritage people. And they said, "Come in and, and do Bart's." And it was really about the same time as I went in to have my operation. So you know, I was Will was being booked to restore. Barts and Barts were restoring me, uh, so it was kind of a rather rather neat. But it's a, I mean, the Great Hall is magnificent, and the staircase with the with the wonderful Hogarth paintings. Um, it needs a bit of cleaning, it needs a bit of tidying, um, but it's going to look absolutely wonderful. And I think I think Barts is such a great um, uh, institution, really, and stretching back to the twelfth century and all that sort of thing. I, I really think it's going to be um, uh, another marvellous, marvellous sort of um, jewel once it's renovated. Well, I wish uh, Will and, and Marcus all best luck with yeah. that. Yes. The 900th anniversary is in three years, so they've got three years to raise, I think, quite a few million pounds. So any, any, any very rich donors might like to uh, <laughs> make a contribution. <laughs> Take my son off my hands, yes, please. Uh, there was a, another scrape you almost got into, um, I was reading, uh, at the end of Round the World in 80 Days, um, there was a connection with the Clapham train crash, was that right? You were almost uh, ready to board that, that particular train? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I mean, we were, we were going hell for leather across the Atlantic on a, a Danish ship. Um, which had promised to get us into Felixstowe on the 79th day of the 80 days, which was, was cutting it very fine. And suddenly we were, we were going towards England and it, it, the ship veered off and went to La Havre. And we said to the captain, what's happening? He said, oh, you know, we're just be stopping here a little bit. Of, uh, we take some timber to La Havre. He said, well, I mean, we thought we were going straight to Felixstowe. You know? Oh, we'll be all right. We'll make that. And that evening, a number of the crew got very twitchy and started looking at timetables for ferries and trains and said we could tonight take a ferry across to Portsmouth and a train tomorrow morning to, to London. But in the end, we decided that it, everything was there. We trusted the Danes and they got us to Felixstowe on time. And eventually I got to the train and then the underground to Oxford Circus. And it was there that we saw in the newspapers that there'd been a, a terrible train crash at uh, Clapham Junction, a lot of people killed. And I suppose you could say it was very likely that we would have been on that train if we'd taken the first option. Wow. Uh, another close shave, uh, in a lifetime of close shaves, I think. Um, well, thank you so much, Michael. It's, we're nearly out of time now. So uh, in spite of a couple of technical hitches there, the fire alarm and uh, my... Yes. Uh, that was, I can't find out what's happening. <laughs> I might find the house is burnt out. There was, a rumor, there was a rumor your house had burnt down in the newspapers two weeks ago. Oh, yes, it? that's right. Yeah. Well, that was the result of me writing a comic uh, piece about recovering from, uh, uh, from heart surgery and all the things that could go wrong, including my kitchen burning down. And someone picked it up and taken it absolutely seriously. And it ended up with me being in a burning kitchen and my 86 year old neighbor who had had sex duple heart surgery only a week before dragged me to safety. And someone read this and took it literally. So it shows how little they know about problems of heart surgery.
<laughs> well, thank you so much for, uh, it, it, it really is true. You are the nicest man in, in, in Britain, especially. <laughs> no, no, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you too. I've got a couple of announcements to uh, to make because uh, the the RSM, as you've already heard, uh, it continues its mission to educate doctors, uh, not just in the UK but all over the world, actually. So anybody who would like to support our uh, academic and educational efforts, please do make a donation. Don't forget Michael Palin's own uh, uh, charity for stammering children. And don't forget Bart's Heritage too. So we've got three uh, plugs to give. Uh, and I also want to mention that uh, tomorrow, Simon Wesley, our president, is talking to amazing uh, Mark, Dr. Margaret McCartney. Uh, next week, next Wednesday, he's interviewing Philippe Sands, uh, international lawyer extraordinaire. And my last announcement is that uh, Jane McQuitty is doing virtual wine test tasting uh, for the RSM. Uh, on three consecutive Thursdays, starting next Thursday. So the wine drinkers amongst you, please do register for that, sign up and drink some wine with us. But uh, a final farewell to the amazing Sir Michael Palin. Michael. Cheers. Thank you. And thank you Cheers. so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.